Welcome to the Behind the Bits podcast. Your host, Scott Curtis, wants to learn everything he can about stand-up comedy and take you along for the ride. Scott and his guests talk serious about comedy in every episode. Behind the Bits will uncover knowledge from different perspectives on subjects such as writing and performing stand-up comedy, as well as booking shows and the comedy life. If you're thinking about becoming a stand-up comic, already in the comic game, or a comedy nerd, Behind the Bits is the show for you. Now, let's get Behind the Bits. Welcome back to the Behind the Bits podcast. I'm still Scott Curtis, and I've got Bob Zaney with me. How are you doing, Bob? Doing great, Scott. You know, I've always wanted to be behind a bit. I hate to be ahead of it. <laughs> yeah, being behind is great. Now, I got to mm-hmm. say, I probably know way too much about you. It's uh, it's kind of getting from uh, the being a super fan to uh, being kind of a stalker. So I already know everything about you. Um, well, I think that chip you had implanted in me, it's kind of my fault. Yeah. <laughs> I should have I said no. <laughs> For instance, your co-star in the, in the movie 23 Minutes to Midnight is uh, Nia Peoples, and you went to school with her, right? Yeah, it's actually called 23 Minutes to Sunrise. It's out there somewhere. I know it was in Redbox for a while, which was kind of cool. Yeah. Going to a convenience store and seeing my uh, name on a Redbox. But uh, yeah, Nia and I went to high school together. She's class of 1980, as class of 79. She actually gave me rides to school her junior year. And uh, then we ended up doing shows together at the Ice House in Pasadena, inviting everybody from high school to come see. And then she went in a separate direction called Success. And I'm here <laughs> talking with you. <laughs> oh, you've arrived, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I'm calling you from a dog park in Henderson, uh, <clears throat> Henderson, Nevada. And let me tell you something. These dogs aren't practicing social distancing. <laughs> And, you know, that's the thing that cracks me up about it, Scott. Think about it. Dogs are supposed to have a, a, a our, their sense of smells like 500,000 times better than ours. Yeah. So couldn't you just, like, you know, call that in? Yeah. Hey, isn't that, <laughs> isn't that peppy about three blocks over his ass? <laughs> yeah, it, I, think, I think that's a great idea. If we can train them to do that, that would be, that would be better. Because uh, yeah, we don't we, need to see we, that. We don't need to see the butt whole, smelling. Right. It's a whole new world with this COVID-19 thing going on. By the way, I suggest everybody COVID nineteen when it hits twenty sell. <laughs> You're still writing, aren't you? Oh, all the time. I have no other. You know what? I'm not saying that some of these stores are, are price gouging, but I, I couldn't believe how many times I heard price check at the ninety nine cent only store. <laughs> oh, and I know the podcast isn't about jokes and stuff. It's more about the seriousness of it all and. Really, you have to be a very serious human being to want to be funny. I'll tell you that much. And I'm not being sarcastic or facetious. Right. And and that's, you know, I've, you know, any comic that's listening to this that doesn't know about your career and uh, how long you've been traveling and just doing doing the circuit um, that, you know, they need to know because you're you're kind of the godfather right now and you're the you're the one that has done all the work and did what needs to be done even though um you were close but no cigar in uh, a lot of things well yeah uh I, I think there's a few people like that in this business that can say that but i always i always point when people say you know they talk about flattening the curve right now with mm-hmm. this with the disease well my my career's been a flat line, but at least it's it's been consistent. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. I mean, some of them. Have, well, I have a lot of old friends in the business who went far up and then way down, and I never even hear from them again. Yeah. Yeah. Are you uh uh still friends with um Murray um Langston? Yeah. I I don't know. Unless was there a falling out that I didn't hear about? No, I, I just wondered. I, I follow him on Facebook and he, he puts out some, uh, funny and weird content. Yeah. He's constantly uh, putting stuff on Facebook jokes and stuff. Or yeah, he's a, he's a, he's one of those guys that in the beginning was uh, kind of there for me, you know, doing that movie with Linda Blair and him was a amazing experience. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously he, uh, he, uh, shared some, uh, 
uh, of the same interest as you because you did the gong show and uh, he did the gong show too. Right. Where my episode, I wasn't on with him, but about three years later, I was a messenger in Hollywood and I actually delivered a check to him somewhere. Maybe it was to his accountant and you could see through the envelope and it was like a check for $40,000. And this is like 1980. <laughs> And I'm going, hey, wait a second. Maybe <laughs> we're going to go in the right business. Yeah, no doubt. But now, then about eight years later, we uh, did the movie Up Your Alley. And uh, we they called it a labor of love, which means we didn't get paid much. Right. <laughs> That's for sure. Now, obviously, when we first started talking, you, you threw out a couple good uh, current one-liners. And most of your humor has to be relatively current like for the zany report that you do on bob and tob and stuff like that right. what is your process to to get the jokes going i mean you you obviously can fire them out pretty quick do you just like read the paper or check the internet yeah. and write from there yeah i'm actually a, a newspaper guy still uh, i of course i'll get then of course if i hear something on the radio or the tv or see something that you know pops out yeah but most of the stuff i write i i immediately will circle us i read the 50 story wrap up in usa today and there's always like three or four good ones in there and then i go well there's a potential for a joke here and i'll circle it then i'll come back and then i'll uh, i i sit down and i write like 15 to 20 jokes and i don't stop and i don't stop to think about if they're funny or not and then I put them in a pile, and then I revisit them in a couple of days later, and, and pick through what I like. Mm -hmm. Now, is that so like it, is that like it, something it, that you do every day? No, I don't do it every day at all. Uh, I do it like once or twice a week, and I also take a lot of notes during the week. And I, like I said, I'll circle stories, and then I sit down and you know go out, you know, look at them again. And then there's some jokes that just happen, you know. I mean. Most a lot. Of, I'm fortunate enough where I'm working the crowd and I'm writing bits just off the crowd that I can actually use again. And I'll give you an example. I was in uh, Deer, uh, Loves Park, Illinois, and the mayor was in the audience, and uh, his name was Mayor Jury. So I said, I guess when you have sex with your wife, she calls it jury duty. <laughs> and then he said, Yeah, because uh, he said, Yeah, because every time we try, she try gets out of it. <laughs> Now, that's a really solid little joke in my act now. Yeah. And, and I actually, the, I'm the one who said she's always trying to get out of it, but it's better structurally for the joke for him to say that, you know? Right, right. Now, if anybody's seen you, they know how fast you are. And, you, I mean, the crowd work is just fantastic. I mean, it, you, you kind of got a little bit of a Rickles type thing going on, but it's definitely all you. When you first started doing stand up, did the was the crowd work in there, or when did that come in for you? Uh, I think the crowd work started happening probably just a few years in, but I wasn't very good at it. I mean, I would have moments, but there's it, it took me a good fifteen to twenty years to develop the point where I I just I know what I'm doing and I can I can I can make it happen. I I, I hate watching comics who can't do crowd work do crowd work. Mm -hmm. It really, it's, it's, it's just so, def oh yeah, really? And then was that the response? I did a TV show. It was called World's Dumbest Criminals. And what they do is they have you come in and you comment on, uh, <clears throat> you know, all these wacky videos, right? I don't know if you remember that show. I think it was yeah, like, I do. like, and so I go in and I, I have all these great jokes and I, I, I tape it out and then, you know, six months goes by and I, I, I asked my manager, is that going to ever air? She said, oh, you didn't make the cut. I so I watched the episode that I did and every comic they turned to, uh, I mean, they would cut to, they would go, wow, what was that? <laughs> That's what they said. And I'm just going, okay, so you really didn't need anyone real. You needed a cheerleader. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's a, it was a great learning experience, you know? Right. Because God forbid funny would fall into it. And I know about story structure and some jokes don't belong in a story because it just doesn't make sense. But this was a show making fun of people. Maybe the guy, you know, making fun of him could be funny. Mm -hmm. Instead of, wow, yeah. what was that? <laughs> it was, it was. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Yeah. So thinking, thinking about the crowd work, you, you said you weren't very good at it. What makes someone good at crowd work? I think listening. 
and not being afraid of what, you know, if they go on a little too long and, and not feeling you have to dominate it with a joke. Mm-hmm. Because, I yes, yes, I have jokes ready for certain things people say, but they have to say them the right way. And then there's times that the, I have the perfect joke to say, and I'll, I'll challenge myself and go go a different direction, and it works just as good, if not better. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's really about being in the moment and being present. And I, I don't know if you can... You know, that's what acting is all about. You just, you're reacting. You're right. reacting to the situation. So right. I'll give you an example. I did this show, uh, my last show, I think. I don't know. I don't know when my next show is, <laughs> but my last show, I did this show where uh, this woman was leaving to go to the bathroom during the first act and then started doing it with me and came back. And she was a rather, rather large woman. And I, I said, I mean, I was going back and forth and getting some laughs. I wasn't being too mean to her, but. Mm-hmm. Finally, she said something. I just bought three hundred and forty dollars in groceries because of what's going on in the country. I said, "What? Well, that's going to last you a day?" <laughs> and the whole place went nuts, you know. <laughs> but it was just like it wasn't the first thing she said or anything. It was like it kept leading up to the point she pushed it. She pushed it, and she's like, "They have no idea what I'm holding back." Yeah, that that's great. I I mean, I've been in the audience where uh, you've been talking to somebody and they just you you know you hear their whole life story and you've you probably end up with like four or five tags just from them talking and if if you're listening then you can you can really respond and it's an art i it's definitely an art that i haven't tried yet and uh i'm a little scared so you know well it's just doing it you know that's the whole thing but i you know i always tell people my show is kind of like a talk show without the desk and chair when I'm talking with the audience. So yeah. I, I really enjoy it. And you know what? It's like, it's like everything that happens, there has to be something new. So these people are new and sometimes you hear the same stuff, but a lot, there's a lot of unique stuff they say to you and you just go, wow, there was a guy in Lincoln, Nebraska. I said, what do you do for a living? He says, I work at a, uh, at a, uh, <clears throat> why am I blanking on this? <laughs> a fruitcake factory. Uh. <laughs> I said, wow. I guess the best thing about that job, not a lot of employee theft. <laughs> and, then, and then he said, yeah, when we do inventory, we end up with more than we started with. <laughs> and again, it was like, I've never had anyone tell me they worked at a fruitcake factory, you know? Yeah, I bet. I've never met anyone named Jury. So those are like nuggets that yeah. you find. And then you, then you, you know, the, I would say about 30% of my show is a show that uh, I say things I'll never say again. You know, uh, and I, I did, I was in Israel, uh, twice now and I was supposed to go back in May, but I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. But, um, anyway, I was there and, uh, people were coming up to me and the, boy, you're a lot like Rickles. You're like Rickles out there. Like you kind of said, and I said, mm. which is a great compliment. Don Rickles was the best, right? but Don knew what he was going to say to everybody. Yeah. I gather the information and then say something. So yeah. there's a, it's a little different in the way that working in the crowd. And I'm not taking anything away from Don, but I mean, if you put Don was so funny, you know, like he'd sit panel with Letterman and you'd just be laughing your ass off. But if you put that down on paper, what he said and looked at it, you go, that's not funny. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I was, I was I had, actually I had, reading a, uh, one of the comedy books I was reading. I can't remember who put it out, but they said the, the way to succeed at crowd work is to always have your script ready so you know how you're going to respond no matter what. And then I applied that to what you do, and you're totally different. I mean, you, you don't have a script. You you just listen, which is more of like an improv type thing. It is, and it's also like, you know, it's interviewing skills, you know. It's like you do have to listen to someone else. You know, and God bless Jay Leno, and, you know, he's a great guy and everything, but you know, he was always thinking about the next joke as opposed to listening to what they're saying because they could say stuff that can set you up and you go, boom. Yeah. You know, Carson was great at that. You mm-hmm. know, he just went, he'd wait and, and then you go, I'll give you an example. I did a radio show. I don't know where it was. I've done over 50,000 now that I've realized after I extrapolate the number, but it was just, you know, two people and they had me come in. I was sitting on the back of the room waiting to go on and, you know, they were like, you know, we got to do our segment, blah, blah, blah. Then we'll get to you. It's a fine. And I didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. And then, you know, finally they, they, they said, oh, 
Bob's been real quiet because they told me to be. And then I went off on them. They were on the ground laughing, uh. and I took the, I took the show over. <laughs> Jimmy so, Pardo does that. I did his podcast, and for the first fifteen minutes, he makes you sit there and not say a word, and he keeps referring to you, and you're not allowed to respond. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You should uh, you should do uh, Gottfried's podcast sometime because he'll tell you your whole history before it even gets started, and that's about fifteen minutes. His history or your history? He'll he'll talk about your history. I mean, he basically <laughs> reads your IMDb, your biography, anything you've ever been in, and it, it it's it's hilarious because he goes on for minutes and minutes sometimes. Right, well, the world's longest intro. Yeah, yeah, and it's just it's just become he did it. You know, he he didn't do it ironically before but now it's a little kind of ironic just because every, it gets them a laugh and the it loosens the guests up because they say oh i didn't even know i did that you know now a lot of people tell you scott you sound like tom Bodette. no so motel six I, huh yeah i feel like i feel like i'm waiting for the light to be turned on <laughs> Come over to Motel 6, sixteen ninety nine, and the beds may or may not have bed bugs. Well, listen, I, we're, I'm going to keep talking to you, but I'm going to drive over to the 99 cent store to get a newspaper because they're only 99 cents. Okay. <laughs> so let's keep talking. I just want, if you hear anything, let me know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're, you're, you're sounding fine so far. Yeah. The sun's coming out, Annie, tomorrow. <laughs> so one of the things I like to ask people um, that are on the show is, uh, you know, can you like pinpoint when um, you decided that comedy was going to be your thing and no matter what, that's what you were going to do? Well, I would, I, I think it was the gong show when I was, I had just turned 16, but I auditioned when I was 15. So I always count those, those two months because mm-hmm. uh, they paid me. They, they, they embarrassed me so much on national TV by pull, having a nun dressed like a, a man dressed like a nun with a big net to pull me off stage. Uh, it was called a specialty act. So I actually got $125 and 98 cents from Astra. And I went, wait a second, I can make money doing this. I mean, I'd maybe make that in two weeks painting houses with my dad, you know, mm-hmm. and that was just a day's work. So I think that was it, but I always could make people laugh for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, when you go back in retrospect, you go, the, the, the hoops and everything I had to do to get to wherever I'm at there, there was, you know, it, it's a, it's a rough road. Mm-hmm. It's a rough road emotionally, not physically. Right. It's like the rejection and, and you know, the audience going, what the hell is this? Staring at you. Yeah. And so you, you decided you were going to do that. And I know that you spent, uh, a number of years as, a, a club runner yourself and yeah. and you you know you you saw a lot of talent go through there um as a club runner what do you look for in a comic to say yeah they're they're okay for the club or yeah i think they're going to probably do well well it was i was a club booker and i pretty much booked my own room so they were all called bob zaney's comedy outlet except for the rodney dangerfield rooms in vegas and la they were at rodney's place mm. for some reason he wanted to go with that name <laughs> but uh anyway i mean i just looked for i gave people shots basically because i knew what it's like for me when i started out and you know it's funny i say that and i only had been doing it for six seven years when i started booking rooms mm. but uh, i'd give them shots but i always told you know them that look i can get you in the door it's up for you to be able to stay on the other side of the door and meaning you know you have to do a good show i can't go to bat for you if you bomb right so it was more about giving people shots and helping them out you know there's a lot of people who work for me that you know andy kindler was like started out with me alonzo bowden i go down the line with names like that who are now you know successful you know well-known comedians Mm mm-hmm did you ever have any that you thought were, uh, they were kind of a bright shining star, star and um, they didn't do so well? Uh, no, but it, but to, to add on to that question, it's interesting. I've asked people about Robin Williams, and I know like Bob Fisher from the Ice House, and a few of these people, when they first saw Robin and how they said, this guy's it, he's the guy, and they were, they were right on on that, you know? Mm-hmm. And you know, there's people like, you know, Letterman who had to have a lot of, you know, failure to finally get success. 
But Robin was those guys that he was just like, boom, 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 boom. And I got to work with him about a year before he passed away at the Throckmorton Theater in Mill Valley, and it was an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. The the booker called me up and said, you know, Rob Williams likes to go up. I was headlining. He'd like to go up after you. And I said, well, does he have a tape? (laughs) But, you know, as you've seen me perform, I'm all over the place. And so I'm on it's a theater stage, so there's a back stage. And I, I, I kept going in the back to talk to, like, someone who's not there. Mm-hmm. And like the first time I did it, there's Robin and he was, he was laughing his ass off and I went, wow. <laughs> but I've been always able to make other comedians laugh and I also make the audience laugh. So I think that's a rare, that's a rare one. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's something that, you know, that, uh, I think a lot of comedians don't understand that when you can make another comedian laugh and they've got respect for you. That's, that's a whole other ball game than making an audience laugh. And and I, I think that's really cool. And I've only, I've only known uh, a few that really do that as well. Well, I, you know, I, Jerry Lewis would introduce me on the telephone as the comedian's comedian. And I think that's fine and everything, but you know, Andy Kindler is a comedian's comedian because he does make all the comics laugh, but, Sometimes the audience, not so much. And, you know, that's how we get paid, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. Yeah. Being able, being able to do both is definitely important. <laughs> so on the other side yeah. of the coin, uh, you know, you, you've been book booking these acts for, for years and stuff like that. Now you've also done a lot of writing for other comics, correct? Yeah. Now, do you still do that? Yeah. Once in a while. I mean, there's, there's a, someone I worked with on this sitcom I did out of Carson City, and she put something together, and I'm writing jokes for her by watching it. Um, so, yeah, and Brad Garrett, I, I wrote some jokes for him recently. And, you know, it, it, I, I do it when I'm asked, and if I, I'll watch somebody I like, and I said, maybe I can give you some stuff, and that's how that works out. So what is the process for writing a joke for somebody else? I you obviously got to know a little bit about them, but how, how, how do you get into their voice and do a joke for them? Well, that's just it. You can give them the best joke in the world and they go, ah, that's, that's not me. So it's up to really them. So you give them enough where they, they find the ones that they think they can put it in their voice, you know, mm-hmm. and they can, you know, there's times, you know, I'll give comics jokes all the time and, and they'll go up and do them and they do them half heartedly and it doesn't work. And they go, see, I go, no, you didn't even try. You threw it away. Mm-hmm. So, and I've done that too with jokes. And then there's jokes you do the first time you ever do them, they destroy. And then they never work again. And you go, what the hell was that? Yeah. So it, it so what that, that's like the placebo effect. So mm-hmm. basically you got the really, you got the really good one that night. Cause you believed in it and you were excited about telling it. And then the next night you, you're so confident in it and it didn't work. Mm. I don't know. It's a, that's a weird one for me. Yeah. Do you have any uh, jokes that you just fell in love with that you don't understand why they don't work? Um, yeah, there's a few. There, one was, you know, my brother and sister are living in their car, and they found out she's pregnant. My brother and sister-in-law. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I'm not from Kentucky. <laughs> uh, my brother and sister are living in their car, and they just found out she's pregnant, so now they're out looking for a bigger car. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, it is funny, yeah. but it doesn't really fit the stage. And then another one, uh, this is like, I have some rejection letters from people because I always try to write for something when I first started out. I have a rejection letter from Mad Magazine telling me that one of my jokes was too offensive. Oh. <laughs> it, it, was a, it was a car for the blind, and I had the little uh, canes in the front going back and forth. <laughs> I took them a diagram and everything. And then uh, I have another rejection letter from Rodney Dangerfield who 10 years later I ended up working uh, for, or it was maybe even eight years later. But anyway, the jokes, I, one of the jokes I submitted was like perfect Rodney. It was, I went to an everything must go sell. They asked me to leave. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it's a, it, and it is, it's their voice and they're the ones that have to sell it. So you just, you sit back and you give them whatever you give them. And you know, it's pick, it's picking and you know, like the writers on a tonight show, I think they have to write like 20 jokes. This is the old days. I don't know what they do now, but they had to write 20 jokes a day and they'd be lucky if they got one or two jokes on in a week. So out of a hundred jokes, if they got one or two, they were batting pretty good. It's like baseball. 
Yeah, I've uh, I've heard some uh, interviews with people who wrote for the Tonight Show, and that's that's exactly what goes on. And I mean, that's a grind. And uh, I mean, you got to pull pull stuff out of nothing sometimes to get those twenty jokes. Yeah. Thinking about the the um, different areas of the country, because you you pretty much do coast to coast, north to south. Do you have any favorite places where uh, your favorite audiences are? No, no, they're all the same. You know, that's your job. Your job is to win over the audience. You know, mm. I don't. I mean, it's and most people get what I do, so I you know I have no complaints. Right. So that's that's something that's interesting to me. I I hear two different approaches from comics some comics say it's you versus the audience and some people say it's your job to create an atmosphere where people can laugh so you're obviously on the uh on the fact that you are serving the audience versus against the audience right Uh, yeah and you're one of them you know i couldn't go out and make fun of people in the audience if i wasn't making fun of myself Mm -hmm. so i mean you are they, they have to get i'm just I'm just, I'm you, but I'm not sitting down in a chair watching me. Right. You know, that's where you have to be with them. You have to be on their level. You're not above them and you're not below them. You're just, you're on their level. But also when people heckle me, I say, I wish you luck. Let's see what happens. (laughs) Uh, You know, I'm a little above their level when it comes to that one. Uh Uh-huh. But. I think I think by now that when you go somewhere, probably at least two thirds of the audience knows who you are and what to expect. Is that do you think that's about right? Uh, maybe half. You know, okay. I'll tell you, it's amazing. It does. You really think you are known? And and I was doing a show at the Maxim Hotel in Las Vegas. This had to be about twenty five years ago. And uh, Brad Upton and I were working together, and we were some lady came up to us after the show and said, you know, you guys are amazing. This is the best comedy show I've ever seen. I went across the street and I saw this guy named Carrot Top at Valley. And all, all he did was props. <laughs> and I'm just going, okay. You didn't know who Carrot Top was, but you just paid five times the amount to go see him because he was in the big room. Yeah. <laughs> so oh. it's like, well, most people, and it's fine with me. I don't, I, it's fine if they know you. I mean, there was a point in the 90s when I had done so much TV, I was getting the old Steve Martin thing where he, why he quit doing comedy because people were yelling out his bits. I was getting that for a while and it, it was a little frustrating, you know? Yeah, I bet. But I was, now people, and people request jokes. I'm more than happy to sneak them in. Yeah, I was always, uh, I, I was in a lot of the audiences in the 90s. Uh, you were playing Midwest. I became like, that's when I became super. F- yeah. Well, that, you're going to really have to rethink that. Yeah. <laughs> so have you had uh, any any times in your career where you said uh, this isn't worth it and wanting to walk away? Uh, no, but I fantasize about having a day job and just going, you know, to work and then coming home. Yeah. Because I did a day job, so I, I knew kind of what that was like. But, uh, you know, everybody has their doubts whenever they do anything. And then they go, oh, is this it? This could be ending now with the COVID-19, baby. Yeah, I know. Who knows when people are going to feel comfortable going back out. Here's another thing. Now I'm at the Dollar Tree, and next door to it is the Plasma Center, (laughs) and the people standing in line outside aren't practicing social distancing. No doubt. So that's good to know that they're donating blood. That That stuff is still open? That's the one way to get a free COVID-19 test. Holy cow. (laughs) That's totally nuts. Um. I, I know I know you're uh, busy and I don't want to keep you forever. Uh, one of the things that I've always admired about you is that you can work 100% clean and you can also um, work w- work a little blue. Um, h- how did that come about and, and how do you differentiate your act and stuff like that between, between the clean and dirty stuff? Well, you know, and I, I think unless you're saying, you know, the F word every five seconds, uh, Clean is uh, and dirty are left to interpretation by audience members. I mean, I've done an adult show where a woman comes up and says, "Wow, you're so funny and you're so clean out there. Thank you." And I go, "Did you watch the show?" <laughs> but uh, you know, I do a lot of corporate stuff and people. You know, I and there's so much on YouTube now of me that I haven't watched and who knows what I'm saying. You know, I always tell them, you know, if they have any doubts, just tell them I did the Jerry Lewis telethon for 17 years and 
I didn't say the F word yeah. on the air. You know what I mean? I know when to be clean and when, I, when not to be. I think any comic who's done a lot of corporate shows where they say, hey, do whatever you want, that's when you have to really hold back. Because mm-hmm. that's some idiot giving you advice. Right, right. So, and you let the audience decide. You know, you, you kind of let the audience go, oh, okay, you're letting me go a little further. And the stuff that's a little off color or the, it's the stuff that gets the biggest laugh. So yeah. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I've, I've watched you walk the line and, uh, go over the line when you found out you could. And that yeah. that's an art cause you're listening again, obviously. Yeah. 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 One, uh, one final thing when you are, uh, look, watching comics now and giving advice to comics, you know, let's pretend like we're the country's not shut down. And, uh, what would you say are the three biggest things a comic needs to know to be successful? Well, it's stage time. It's, it's getting so comfortable with yourself. When you walk out there, there's not a room full of people. You're just standing there you know, with one, one other person talking. You have to be comfortable and likability is important too. I mean, you know, when you said about you against the audience, well, there, there's an adversary thing going like, well, they're the problem. Well, they're not the problem because they're there because of you. Because they, they want to laugh and they want to have a good time. Mm-hmm. So likability is a big one. And, you know, um, wanting to do it in the first place. It, it, the audience can tell if you don't want to be up there. Yeah. You know, I do a joke at the end of my act that um, I've been doing – since like 1981 where, and I remember I had this manager tell me he didn't like the joke and it finally became me. It says, I got to get going cause I don't want to be here. <laughs> and I remember I'm young, I'm like 20, 21. And he saw me because I don't know if that joke, you know, that doesn't make sense to me. Why are you saying that? <laughs> but it took me years to grow into that. I can say that knowing I want to be there, but they get what I'm saying. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, that's that I I've heard that and that's that's just hilarious. Well, Bob, um I really appreciate you being on the show. Is there any uh thing that you'd like to plug before we get off? Right, two things. One dry bar has got my comedy special which is completely clean by the way. It's supposed to uh drop April 15th, but we'll see if it's going to be a little later than that. Okay. So that's kind of cool and then the other thing is I'm starting to sell off a lot of my memorabilia and uh, collectibles on Macari. It's an app. It's called M-E-R-C-A-R-I. Okay. And uh, I had some great stuff. I'm going to have a lot of showbiz stuff there, too, because I got too much. And I don't know what, I don't have any kids, so I have no one to leave it to. Do you have any of the uh, do-the-math baby calculators on there? I mean, that, uh, I, I mean, I guess I could put up some of my merch, but I'm, like, <laughs> limited. I have, like, I have... I have Christmas tree ornaments that we sold. We have <laughs> the fishing bobbers, but I, I don't have many of those left. I don't even have like one of my CDs anymore. Oh, wow. So, I mean, I put out, I put out seven CDs and one album, mm-hmm. but anyway, so it's kind of cool. You can go see stuff. I just sold something yesterday. I bought the space 1999 trading cards unopened. Oh, wow. From 1976. I got a lot of that stuff. So yeah. it's kind of cool. Macari is the app. I guess if you search Bob Zaney, you can find my stuff. Yeah, cool. I'll, uh, I'll put, yeah, I'll put a link to really the Macari really app in the, in the notes here. And, uh, I'll be looking for that dry bar special too. That's, that yeah. sounds great. And, uh, if you want to see some, a good documentary, uh, close, but no cigar is just fantastic. You can, you can still buy that, right? I think it's still on Amazon. Uh, the last time I spoke to the person in charge of that. So I think you can buy a physical copy. I don't know if they set up the downloads again or not. Cause they were one that, you know, pay us 16 cents per view. Yeah. And they, wow. and they charge 10, you know, it's like too much. Yeah. That's like Spotify. Yeah. What a mess. So, but anyway, we'll see what happens. We'll keep moving. Well, Bob, I have to say you've always been one of my favorites and you're one of the reasons why I do stand up now. And I really appreciate you being on the show. Well, if there's anybody in the audience who listens to this podcast, I want you to uh, take Scott's talking and then put it next to Tom Bodette and do one of those scientific <laughs> matches. 
<laughs> I think that's who I'm talking to. And this Scott Curtis guy is somebody who's, uh, it's an alter ego, which <laughs> I think Tom Baudet is an alter ego. <laughs> Yeah, this is Tom Bobadet from Motel 6 telling you have a great people night. People are going to – I hope – do you get emails over these things? Uh, you know, nobody's I, – I get emails, but nobody's ever said I sound like Tom Bodette. I've got well, a few let's – Let's see what they say. They can even email me. It's on the – my email address is at my website, bobzaney.com. So yeah. At, on the Twitter, at Bob Zaney, too. Yep. Thanks a lot. You're the best, baby. Thanks for being on. Have a great day. But 